Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining me for what's going to be a new area of the podcast, something that's going to be slightly different to what I've done so far. Um, so anyone who's been listening to uh, my diary podcast and uh, my stories and things um, will, hear, will have heard that uh, I, I started doing these because I was approached by a comedian, uh, Matt Price, a couple of years ago now, and he was um, talking to criminals and, and specifically ex-offenders, people who have turned their lives around and are, and are no longer active in crime. Um, and he wanted to talk to me about um, sort of, you know, how I managed to spend so long in prison um, and then spend so long out of it and, uh, you know, how I'd, uh, you know, coped with, with rehabilitation and, and moving on, really. And after I'd told my story, um, I then decided to diarise it even further to go into more detail, um, and that's why I do my YouTube video now. Uh, so if it wasn't for him coming and speaking to me, um, I wouldn't do any of these videos now. Uh, so when I decided to interview uh, people um, and, and go in a slightly different direction for this channel, um, it was it was an obvious choice uh, to go with Matt, really. Um, so I hope you enjoy it. He's got a great story. Um, his, his partner was a victim of crime, and uh, that left him in a sticky position um, of how and, uh, and what does he do to retaliate to this. Um, and as a normal person who hasn't really dabbled with crime before, um, he's put in a bit of a sticky position of, uh, of what does he do if he does anything at all. So um, yeah, it's a bit of a long one this one, um, so enjoy, uh, let me know what you think. Um, I'll put the links to, um, to Matt's videos in the description and uh, yeah, let me know what you think and, uh, and uh, there'll be more coming out next week as well. Thank you very much. Okay, so I thought I would do you something a little bit different. And for my first interview, I thought I would speak to the comedian, uh, writer, and all-round good guy, uh, Mr. Matthew Price. Uh, hey, thanks. That, that, was, that was a very nice introduction. And, um, I, and I would say that um, a comedian, absolutely. Well, definitely an all-round good guy, but a comedian, whenever people say, Oh, he's a comedian, and they meet me. They're they're often quite disappointed because I'm not. <laughs> I mean, be honest, I'm not exactly hilarious. You don't think, oh, this guy's great fun, you know? But <laughs> not really. But but I am. Yeah, that's how I met you. I mean, I think I saw yeah. you gigging before yes. I, I met you. Yeah, actually. we did meet. Yeah, um, we met through a, a mutual friend of mine. He's one of my oldest friends. Um, yeah. and he told me he messaged me saying that a comedian he works with um, is interviewing ex offenders yeah. um, and telling the story of how they've kind of moved on. And uh, and you know rehabilitation really rather than the actual crime itself, but the, the you know the kind of rehabilitation of it. Yeah. Um, so he said, you know, do you fancy talking to him? And at that point, sharing my history wasn't something that I'd done loads. Um, and if I had, I'd kind of just told a couple of friends, you know, once I've had a couple of beers and things. And uh, um, it wasn't something I'd done in depth or ever put you know into a recording like mm. I had done with you. So um, first of all, I just have to kind of ask, how did a comedian from Cornwall end up? wanting to interview criminals from you know my kind of background um well like, like most it, it kind of happened by accident and i suppose good fortune as well mm. and there is a sort of a sad element to the story and i'm gonna say without sort of apologizing about it i have never wanted sympathy and i don't really want it now either but something bad happened yeah so i was in a long distance relationship with my message martha yep. who's five foot one glaswegian woman um, the love of my life I was living in Wales she was living in Glasgow and I got a phone call from her at with a, and a message and I was in I was in Leicester at the Leicester Comedy Festival and this message said don't worry about me but I'm in hospital at the moment there's been a bit of an incident wow and that's so typically understated Glaswegian yeah you know, <laughs> I'm in hospital don't yeah, worry about me <laughs> don't worry about me so of course I I found, and it turned out that she'd been attacked by her neighbour who worked above her. Now, he was a local small-time drug dealer okay. who was, um, he tripled in size because he was definitely on steroids. So he was dealing steroids and he was dealing cocaine. Yeah. And he'd always said to her, listen, Martha, if my music's turned up too loud, you let me know, it's not going to be a problem. Yeah. So one night, it was one o'clock in the morning, Monday morning, she went upstairs knocked on the door and said, because they're having a party, said, look, do you mind turning the music down? He said, not a problem. And as she turned away, he attacked her, and it was bad. Yeah. You know, she got some very bad injuries. 
the uh, the out you can see the outline of of the guy's fingers on the back of her neck. Wow. So and I didn't realize until fairly recently there were two of her guys who were kind of kicking her when it, when you know on the floor as well. But but look, people get attacked, and it's not about that. Um, she went deaf in one ear. Well, it is about it. Because I'm Karen talking about it. But what I mean is, it's not the, the details of the crime are neither here nor there. Really, they attacked her in a bad way. She went downstairs. She phoned the police. She lost her hearing in one of her ears. Um, she said it felt like she was underwater. That was permanent, weirdly. And half an hour later, there was a knock at the door. She thought it was the police. And of course it wasn't. It was five of them from upstairs. Blimey, so they come back again? One of them, yeah, they come back and one of them punched her again. Oh no. The police turned up. Um, he, the policeman was very, very upset at the time. Everybody had left by that point. Mm. And he was shouting at her. And he said, a week later, he said to her, look, I'm really, really sorry for shouting at you. He said, and I was emotional. He said, I was upset. I was crying. He said, because in all the years I've been a policeman, I've, you know, said, I've never seen, it was horrible. I, said, yeah. I was so appalled by it. He said, but anyway, he said, I, uh, I've spoken to the guy and we're going to charge him. But anyway, the charges were dropped. So we'll fast forward. The charges forward. were dropped? They were dropped, yeah. How, how, how no did that witnesses. even happen? No, no witnesses. witnesses. No, no witnesses. Sake. And And the sheriff just said, look, it's more hassle than it's worth. So Mark then, in the theory, has to go back home with him living upstairs or working upstairs. That's what she did. She, he was living upstairs above her. Well, this was her home life. At the time, she was working with young men who were taking steroids and snorting cocaine. Yeah. She went back to work the following day. It's mental. And I said to her, <laughs> how could you do that? And yeah. she said to me, well, because that's what I do. She said, you know, she said, look, you know, I, I, she said, I'm a carer. I'm a professional carer working mental health. Yeah. You know, all she's worked with everything, ranging from sort of children who've murdered people to young men with schizophrenia, to young men, you know, involved with substance abuse in this case. And she said, you can't, if you, if you say that you're a carer, you can't just turn it on when you want to. So, so you're she, supposed to care all the time. She was able to look at it objectively then, from a carer's point of view, yeah. professionally and objectively. Yeah, she was. Rather than yeah. looking at it as a victim. Yeah. And yeah. then, because you would have thought that she would then demonise the people that attacked her and that category of people, but then she went straight back and started being helping again. Well, she said, look, not, not everyone's the same. You know, some, some people just need to, to, to talk to somebody to try to understand the root cause of the problem. You know, and they're not all him. They, they haven't all attacked me. No. Th this, this guy has. That was his way of dealing with it. That's extraordinary. Yeah, and, 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 it, and it humbles me as well. And, and it's something that I've only sort of realised recently because we talked about it recently. And this is a long time ago now, yeah. you know, that happened. But... So that, that was very humbling. But of course, I didn't know anything about crime particularly. And the guy was a, you know, a bodybuilder, small-time dealer, had a sports car out the front. And was he beat up a teenage boy in the close and took his top off and was telling everyone, look at me, you know, I'm King Kong. The silverback. The yeah. macho rubbish, <laughs> you know. And who wants it? And, all, and no, nobody wants it. They're all too yeah. scared to say anything. Mags, Martha's sister, was at the local spa shop and overheard him boasting about how he'd been boxing with the neighbours. Yeah. Didn't say it was a woman. So, I was upset, obviously. Martha said to me, you don't do anything. Well, I'm, you know, and I said, well, of course I wouldn't do anything. She said, well, I don't want you trying to take revenge. And no, no, I'm not going to do that. I wouldn't do that. I'm not really into violence, even though I felt like it. And I ended up speaking to a couple of people. And one was an old school sort of debt collector guy. Okay. Who was a friend of the family. Right. Um, Mags went to see him. She got 500 quid out of the building society and said, look, have you heard? And he went, well, yeah, I know what happened. Um, and she said, can I have a gun? <laughs> yeah. So, now, I know that, why that you're laughing quickly. Now. Yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> so hold on, she yeah. was quite pragmatic a minute ago. And then she does, maybe that's the Glaswegian in her. <laughs> well, no, but it, well, well, that's the Glaswegian in Max. It wasn't Martha who was. Oh, oh, okay. Right. Yeah, no, no, it was Max, her sister, who went to buy a gun. Right. I want to go and shoot the guy because he's been boasting about boxing with the neighbours. And he said, no, you're not having one. And she said, well, why is that then? And they had a bit of a, you know, a bit of an, they call it a stushy. Okay. But a mild argument in Glasgow. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and he said, because you'll go to jail. Yeah. You know, you, you're going to end up in jail. And he said, do you know what it's like to shoot someone? And she went, no. He said, well, you're not going to like it. You're not going to enjoy it. No. He said, there's no receipts. He said, you know, we're talking crime here. 
She says, the best thing you can do is take the 500 quid, buy your sister something nice. Yeah. And then he went into graphic detail about what it's like to stab somebody. And he said, I thought, he said, when I stabbed someone years ago, and I thought at the time before I met him, I was a bit macho. Yeah. You know. And he said, but he said, well, I thought stabbing someone would be like sticking a knife in a tumshi or a turnip. Yeah. He says, it's not. He says, it's a very distinctive sound and the look in the person's eyes when you do it. He said, you never forget it. He said, and you will get caught and you'll go to jail. He said, trust me, even if you've got a gun off someone, you're the one who's going to go to jail. Yeah. So just forget about it. And I met him and I sort of said, look, you know, I've heard about your reputation and I heard that back in the day you used to screw people's hands into tables to get their undivided attention. Mm. And he kind of, you know, half smiled, <laughs> half rolled his eyes <laughs> because I've learned about the mythology of people. And yeah. I said to him, did, did that not lead to more violence and he said well only if I met the person who owned the table <laughs> like, okay I'm not quite sure what to do with this yeah so anyway um I spoke to him about it and he said look the best thing you can do is nothing yeah so but then I was interested I spoke to somebody else um 2008 this was now at the Edinburgh Festival I got a phone call saying from somebody I knew be at Buchanan Street bus station at this time I'm going to take you for a drive Okay. <laughs> well. um, to, to go and meet someone who can help you. And I got a replacement because comedians are quite happy to stand in for other comedians, yeah. oddly enough. And I think the guy might have thought, well, if he goes missing, you know, I can just fill in for him. Exactly. This that, could be how, my showbiz break. How long ago, how, how long after the, the Martha getting attacked now was this? That so, would have been about 18 months after. So a little while has passed now. Yeah, a little while has passed. <clears throat> Um, still very raw about the whole thing. Yeah. Still very upset Definitely. and very raw about it all. And so I, I, I went because I thought, well, I told her I'm not going to beat anybody up, but I'm going to go and speak to this guy. Mm. And I get there. And of course, I was a very big unit at the time, yeah. 20 plus stone, 23 stone, something like that. And the other guy was exactly the same. Mm. So we go to a hotel in Glasgow, quite a nice hotel, and we go into the car park and and we go to the gym and there's a guy in his mid-70s, the guy who's going to help me, white hair, he's running on the treadmill and he stops for a bit when my friend goes in to see him and there's, a, there's only him and a couple of other people in there and the, someone who's running the gym and they kind of looked at the pair of, of us as if to think, well, are you friend or foe? Because we yeah. know who this guy is. Clearly we're a friend. Yeah. And the guy just looked over at me and he nodded. <laughs> and we went upstairs it's not something out of a film. I know how ridiculous it sounds. Yeah, no, it's because this is how it happens. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, good, thank you. Yeah. Right? So, so I go upstairs and I'm sat in the middle of, of the hotel and I was told where to sit. Mm. And my friend said, right, I'm going to leave you here. It'll be up in half an hour. About an hour and a half later, he comes over, dressed in a suit, and he says to me, hello, how are you? And I said, yeah, I'm good, thank you. How are you? Nice to meet you. And he says, uh, what do you want? And it was very nice the way he said it. Mm. And I said, I don't know. Because <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah. And I figured, well, Martha has always said to me, look, here's the thing about Glaswegians. And I think it applies to people involved in crime as well. Mm. She said to me, I said to her, I'm worried about the first time. First time I went to Glasgow, I was worried. I said, I'm worried about going up to Glasgow because, you know, how do I know if I'm going to be accepted? She said to me, listen, she said, do not be a cunt. Forgive mm. my language. And I said, well, I want to know if I'm being one. She said, you'll know. <laughs> you will find out straight away in no uncertain terms. Yeah. So I figured, well, if I'm going to meet this guy, I might just as well be honest. So I said, I don't know what I want. And he said, well, how about I buy you a cup of coffee and we find out. Mm. So I told him about Martha getting attacked and what happened. And he, said, he explained to me, we were together for eight hours in total, but he explained to me, he said, look, I've sat you here because there's cameras. He goes, if anything did kick off, it's on camera. Yeah. He said, so I'm just protecting you. So there's nothing to be afraid of. He said, can I ask you though, are you, are you fear? Are you afraid? And I said, yes. And he kind of <laughs> chuckled a bit and he went, well, that's all right. He goes, mm. you're allowed to be. He goes, listen, you don't know me and I don't know you. Yeah. He said, but I'm going to trust you. Mm. He said, I'm going to respect you. And I know you're going to respect me. And then he said, there's two rival drug gangs in here. He goes, they talk about respect and they talk about fear. He said, but the two are very blended. He said, really, they trade on fear. And I'd never mm. heard any of this before. Yeah. He says, a guy over there who's got a slash down his face. 
He said, the guy who did it, his dad shot him. Didn't kill him. He said, he shot him. He said, that's how we deal with stuff. He said, you understand? He said, a very visceral, very immediate reaction. He said, you know, yes, people could technically take a hit out on somebody. It's not that. Mm. He said, there's an argument. You want it resolved. Bang. There you go. Do you know how difficult it is to shoot someone and not kill them, though? Oh, I mean, <laughs> it must be very, very hard. <laughs> just, yeah. It must yeah, be very, as a, as very hard. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I can't even imagine. At the time, I was just like, oh, my God. Mm. And he said, I study people. And I said, what do I call you? And he said, told me his name. And I said, no, I mean, like, are you, are you a, a, a bad guy? Mm. You know, <laughs> can you imagine? No, exactly. God knows what he must have been thinking. I said, are you like a gangster? And he went, no, he said, I'm a thief. And he said, I'm, I'm old school thief, never been involved with drugs. It's not really my thing. He said, I study people. So grew up in the east end of Glasgow as a shoplifter. And he said, I went to school with 10 people, 10 people who committed murder. Mm. just in my class it doesn't justify it and he was so thoughtful yeah and so interested in how he sort of framed everything and then he said to me now i don't know you he said but i can see the heart in your eyes he said the type of hate that you have and the feeling that you have he said you really want to unleash that he said and i know i know it he said i know you want to hurt the guy who did it yeah he said but that type of hurt he said and that type of the pain you want to inflict upon that man that you feel that's very real he said, once you do it, that'll change you forever. Mm. He said, that'll change you for the rest of your life. And you need to ask yourself, are you willing to make that change? He said, I know what I would do. He said, but I'm not you. Yeah. He said, so you need to decide for you. And he talked me through it. And he said, do you love her You know more than you hate the guy who attacked her? And I said, yes. And he said, well, there you go then. You already know your answer. And he said, nobody would blame you if you kicked his door down in the middle of the night and beat him to death. Yeah. He said, but there's consequences to that. Mm. He goes, we're talking about business as a professional criminal you try not to be too emotional about stuff he said, this is deeply emotional to you mm. he said but you know try to understand what it is that's making yourself making you feel this way mm. which is very insightful and he said and stay away from people who deal drugs and i said and i didn't know at the time what he meant and what i'm going to clarify that what he meant was he said um he said they're active criminals are right they're a rival drug gang he said, and I know that you want to prove yourself. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, how do you know this? How do you know that? Yeah. You know, cause you're a people watcher, but how, how do you know? And he said, he said, you want to prove yourself? He said, and I know that, yes. He said, I can introduce you to them. He said, but they, they don't care about you. They don't care about human life. Do you understand that? He said, it's about money. Yeah. He said, and that's fine. And that's what they do. I say hello to them as a courtesy. They say hello to me as a courtesy. He then explained about the art of shoplifting and how he had, used to have a, had a big Mac, you know, a, a long raincoat, he said, which during the summer months you would get strange looks by people <laughs> in Glasgow. He said, but he would steal to order. Yeah. You know, and then he's, he nicked one for his mates, which make it do the same. He said, before long, they were robbing warehouses. Mm. He said, and then someone said, oh, can you rob another warehouse? And he said, I know the way the kidology of crime works and the way the mythology is. Exactly the same warehouse. He said, look, this is a more complex warehouse. I'm going to have to charge you more money because they've got a different alarm system in there. Yeah. So, you know, you know, there's, there's, there's a scale to the, the pricing. <laughs> you know, I mean, amazing, right? Mm. So, to me, anyway, I never heard anything like this. And so, and he said, and of course, it was a dead easy job. We just charged them more money. Yeah. And he said we, that we had to charge them extra for getting rid of the computers as well. He said to, to, to dispose of it, it didn't we chuck them in the river? <laughs> <laughs> he said, but that's not the point. He said, but I, I told him I had a guy who disposed of them. He said, but this is the kidology of crime. And he spoke about mythology. He said, and the way that people sort of front things out. Mm. And he said, you know, it's, he said, I would never, he didn't talk about, because a lot, lot of criminals, as you know, or ex-cons anyway, that they will just, this person isn't real. Mm. They're not as real mm. as me. He wasn't saying that. He was just saying that, that there is a certain amount of kidology in, in the crime world and that he'd studied people. I went to his funeral actually 18 months later and he, the, he had 400 or so people there and the minister was shaking because he knew who he was. Yeah. But then he got more confident and the eulogy was great, you know, and the, and the guy said, his best mate said, well, you know, so-and-so died. He said he was a lifelong collector. And he said, unfortunately, most of the things he collected belonged to other people. <laughs> And, uh, and the, the whole place was <laughs> roaring. And then the minister, they all sang, and the minister said, um, and I sat on the back with a bunch of, you know, really dangerous looking dudes. The minister said, look, he said, we're going to sing this final hymn. 
and uh, I'm going to ask you all to maybe sit this one out. And they're all laughing again because they can't sing. You know, they're, they're, yeah. they're half the Glaswegian faces are there. And so they had a chorus to sing in, you know, and his grandson gave a eulogy and all that. And it struck me that when I heard people say about, yes, he was a criminal, for want of a better term, and I don't use that as a majority term, he was a criminal, but he he also had a very humane side to him. There was more to him just than, than just yeah. crimes. So it was it was almost like it was his job, like anything else, but he was a yeah. nice guy other than that. Yeah, he was a nice yeah. guy, and he helped people, and he gave money in the local community. Yeah. And there was someone there from America who said, oh yeah, I bumped into him by accident, and um, he asked me for directions, and uh, no, I asked him for directions, and he gave me directions, and I gave him, you know, a couple of pounds or whatever, and we just stayed in touch. Yeah. You know, because he was that kind of guy. And I'm not romanticising him, but I'm talking about the guy I met. And what really struck me was, wow, you know, OK, that, that's what you were. Unbeknown to me, he was dying of cancer. Really? He drove me all around Glasgow, took me to his house, showed me pictures of him with various people. And it wasn't, oh, look at me with this person and that person. So, oh, yeah, I went to that box and do so and so was there. Yeah. You know, he had a nice little house. He said, oh, yeah, we're in kind of like this area is where most of the sex workers are now. <laughs> it was quite like, it was almost like, you know, those bus tours that you go on. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, they, they, the criminal a, underworld. Yeah. Right? Maybe they should do a crime tour of Glasgow or something because, I mean, you can't. But it, but it was just, it was fascinating. He wasn't, he wasn't telling me anything that would get anyone into trouble. Mm. But he was just kind of saying this part of the city now is, it tends to be, such and such a, a demographic and type of person who runs this, you know, and yeah. talked about drugs and and various various forms of crimes that existed. But what fascinated me was his insight. Mm. The fact that after, because he was retired, yeah, and he said, you know, he said, I've never really properly retired. I still know what's going on. Yeah, you know, his mid seventies. He's got the elder statesman thing, mm. so people respect him, so they'll come for his advice. But I don't commit crime anymore. Yeah, and I believed him. But what I really liked about him was that he was just so insightful and just seemed to understand so many things. And all right, maybe you could say, oh, it's not difficult to read me. You know, I'm upset. I'm a straight goer. I don't know what the hell I'm doing. And I'm saying to him, well, look, um, is it possible to get somebody killed? <laughs> you know? and, and he very patiently sort of said to me, not really. Yeah. He said, it's sort of technically possible he said, but I, it's not really like that. He said, you know, we don't have a price list. You so there know, wasn't a menu of like no, you know, arms, legs. No, know. and I've since, <laughs> I've since said to people, other comedians who've sort of said to me, oh, um, you know, oh, oh so, so you know all these criminals now. And I go, well, they're ex-criminals, you know, but yeah. you're all, can you get somebody killed? And I always say, yeah, yeah, I can. Wow, amazing. And I go, yeah, but look, you know, the thing is, January is the quiet time. So you might get a two for one offer, and I go really, <laughs> and I go no, don't be so ridiculous. That's not how it works, and so and that's how I sort of wanted to speak to him. So I, I spoke to him, and it it helped. It was very interesting. I did. I managed to to sort of just walk away and do nothing, but it was still festering inside me, and I I spoke about it to someone, and I got introduced to various people, and it just went from there. And then I realised, oh, maybe I can make it into a podcast. Mm and speak to people and what I wanted was people who could offer an insight into things sure and that, that's what I got yeah and, and, and that's and that's what I found fascinating it's just that there are so many people as you know as you pointed out to me as well there's so many people who are in prison for so many different reasons and they each have their own story and their own journey mm. and I could learn from all of them and I have so you saw the you saw the you know the organised crime guy and he kind of did he talk you out of doing anything or did he just say that you don't want the the services we're offering or I think he kind of used a bit of kidology on me as well or a bit of psychology yeah. on me yeah you know because when he said to me I know what I would do but I'm not you that really struck home mm. because I thought yeah I really am very much on my own because that, it it's something that I've thought about myself as in like what would what would happen if anything happened to my wife mm. um and i've you know run through the scenarios of you know if it was you know if she got robbed or mugged or attacked or anything like this and yeah. i would i would find them and i would i would inflict the most pain i could on them yeah, yeah. Um, and if i went to jail i went to jail 
Or if they ended up in jail for what they did to Helen, I would get myself put into jail um, right. so I could yeah. get them in jail. Yeah. Um, and I was just thought I'm perfectly capable and I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with either of those options. Yes. Um, yeah. And but that's because of my skill set. You know, that's because of you know I've been in jail and I, I don't I don't mind swimming in those waters. Absolutely, yeah. But it, I found it really interesting for someone like you and for me personally, um, it would eat me alive not doing anything oh it did for a lot of years yeah and, I, and it, I find it really interesting that you took these steps and for so long you were taking these steps you know 18 months down the road just still thinking about I want to get this guy and you actually you know you've, you've ventured into the world of organised crime yes. with some serious dudes yeah, well yeah yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Um, you know which is, which is something that most people wouldn't do and it's only because you had those kind of connections which yeah. some people may not have always had so you True. did you did have inlets you know you mm. haven't just picked up a phone book and, and looked for you know gangster in the phone books or no. thing. oh no so how did that equate then? So when you when you when you decided to do the podcast, who, how did you even approach? You know, how did you pick a criminal to go and speak to? Or <laughs> how did it even work? <laughs> you know like, well, I think I think I I knew somebody, a guy I refer to as Stab Vest Steve, who um, who once sent me a stab vest through the post just for a joke. Fantastic. <laughs> and he's the guy who um, I mean he's very funny. <laughs> he's such an idiot. I love him to bits. And um, he he. He got in contact with me because he sort of read about what happened to Martha and he said, look, I'm not a weirdo. Do you want to come and meet me? And I went, all right. Because I'll, I'll <laughs> meet anybody. Yeah. But, and and, and, and that, that's another thing. And I want to make it... I, I, well, not making it. Doesn't matter. I, I'm not a particularly brave bloke, but the Cornishman in me especially, I will go and yap with anyone anywhere because sure. I always assume everything's going to work out all right. Now, that in itself is fairly brave. Because most people would just be like, I'm not going to do it. Stupid. Yeah. Probably stupid. But it's it's got an element of break. Because, you know, just even going off, driving around Glasgow with a gangster and everything, that's that's not something that most people would do. Um, no, probably not. But no. I didn't view it like that. <laughs> I just view it as, well, this is interesting. Yeah. And I think that he must have thought, I haven't, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. Mm. And I think I got lucky. Yeah. I think I got lucky meeting him. Because mm -hmm. anyone else could have taken advantage. And I even said to me, you do realise 30 years ago I'd probably have robbed you. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I said, "Oh, yeah, probably." Yeah. You know, but but that wasn't. But that's not the point. We were there and then, mm. and you know, and I'm meeting a guy who I know nothing about. So I was just happy to take him as I find him, which makes me sound, I don't know, like a little bit happy, clappy, and but 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 I am, I suppose, I'm ha happy to meet people, and I, I yeah, I suppose I I didn't know what I was getting into. So but Stanfest Steve, who I, I met him, and you know, he he. he um, him and his mate nicked. He explained what the crime was he, that he did. He, he nicked um, a massage chair <laughs> from a service station and to take to his auntie who had a bad back. And they broke it open so he could just use one pound coin to make it work. <laughs> and she was so angry. Yeah. And said, you're going to have to take it back. And he got arrested taking it back. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> which is, which is ridiculous. And I thought, and I thought at the time... Well, you must be all right. You know, your yeah. heart's in the right place. I don't think that's a severe no. criminal. Maybe it might be, unless he could, but you can't tell with people, right? So no, once exactly. again, I took him at face value, and he said, "Oh yeah, he said stab vests." I mean, I just, I got, I, I got some. I said, "You have knocked off stab vests." Well, not knocked off. You know, I acquired them. Thank yeah. you, I'm an animal. <laughs> and he said, he said, what I do? He said, I get people to test them up by by stabbing me in the stab vest. He goes, because obviously, I'm not going to sell. It might be moody, but it's not shit stuff. No. He said, and I said to this one guy, he said, come on, he fucking stabbed me. Go on, it's top of the range, mate. He said, and he actually stabbed me in the arm. <laughs> he said, and that's <laughs> why I've got a, a scar on my arm now. And I thought, wow, th this is not, th this is what you do. And he's a wheeler dealer guy. And he was quite nurturing. And I think I explained, when I explain about Martha, People are actually all right about it. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, I there, there was one guy. Uh, Stephen introduced me to a guy actually, and I, I, I wasn't even intending on interviewing him. Mm. So he just he said, "Oh, this guy's the real deal. Come and meet him." So we're sat in the car, and I'm sat in the car like this, and the guy is sat behind me, and I I'm because I was too big to even physically to turn around. Yeah, and Steve is going, "Oh, I remember that time, Kev, or whatever his name was." I know his name, I want to say it. Um, remember that time you slashed that geezer's face? And he went, no, I have absolutely no <laughs> recollection whatsoever of that. That You are confusing me with some... No, you do. It was outside. And he went, oi, hang on. Oi, 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 oi. And he went, and who the fuck are you, mate? And he poked me in the back like this. He said, my name's Matt. I'm a comedian. You don't look very fucking funny. <laughs> and I was like, oh. 
So we went to a local pub and there weren't many people in there. This was during the day. And I had, I had a bit of flu at the time. It was about, three, about four years ago. And Martha said to me, you need to drink loads of water. So I did. I'm busting to go for a pee. Yeah. Right? And this is how sort of naive I can be at times. I don't I play on it on stage, but I'm not really. But I'm busting to go for a pee. Someone had said to me, football casual said, if you go to an away pub, you need to know where the toilet is. Because a classic trick is I go, where's the toilets? And if you don't know, they'll beat you up. Right. You should never ask someone in an away pub where the toilets are. So we get there and already this guy is suspicious of me. You know, I don't look funny. <laughs> and and and, so, and he doesn't know what it is that I want. I've got a recording device. Mm. And he's thinking, am I, am I undercover or something like that? Because oh, I yeah. could be. Easily. And I'm wriggling around because I'm busting to go for a pee. But yeah. I'm in an away pub. I know it's in a different context, but that's not the point. I've remembered bits of wisdom. Yeah. And I'm looking around. So I'm looking extremely twitchy. Now, am I looking for where the cameras are? Am I looking for, you know, maybe the drug squad to come in or something? Or the armed police or my colleagues? Yeah. And he, he says to me, are you all right, mate? Are you all right? And he said, what the fuck's wrong with your mate? And I go, mate, I'm busting to go for a peek and tell me where the toilets are, please. <laughs> <laughs> and he went, they're over there. <laughs> so I went for a pee and I came back and I said, oh, thank you so much. I was absolutely yeah. dying. But of course, I'm sweating and shaking because I've got the flu as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he says, what was that all about? And then have you got a wire? I said, no, I haven't got a wire on me. I, I, I don't use a lavalier mic. Which is that you know like that that's not, not a wire but it's like a white like a lapel mic. Yeah. Then I realised I meant a police wire. I went no no I haven't got anything like that no no I haven't. And and he said well you, you look so nice. I said look I said um, a football casual said to me you should never ask someone in a pub that you don't know where the toilets are because you get beaten up. And he went mate. I know you're not from round here because I've never fucking seen you before. <laughs> and no one drinks here. It's a shit pub. <laughs> he said so you did all that for nothing. And then, then I tried to interview him, and it was terrible. Mm. And then, and then there was a power ballad. There was eighties power ballads that came on, and um, and um, Aerosmith's "I Don't Want to Close My Eyes," you know, and all that was yeah. playing. As he was saying, saying to me, "Well, I mean, you know, you're hopeless at this, mate. You're terrible." And I, I in the end, I deleted the recording. I had to, but he phoned me about a week later, and he said, oh, "Hello, Matt." He goes, I've been doing my research into you. He goes, oh, oh, yeah, of course, at the end of that interaction, two football casuals came in. Yeah. My mate, Steve, didn't like these two guys because they were dodgy, so he ran out quite quickly. <laughs> so I ran quite quickly after him as well. So now the guy is confused because he's like, what, why are they leaving so quickly? Yeah. So a week later, he phones up, I've done my research into you. Um... You really are who, exactly who you say you are, aren't you? And I went, yes, I am. He went, oh, my God. This is only four years ago. He said, you've got so much to learn, mate. He goes, when am I going to begin with you? He said, he said, God, he said, you can't speak to criminals. You know, he said, because there were people, you could end up getting killed. Yeah. And I said, well, look, I, I don't think I'm going to. He said, well, no, but you might get beaten up. You might get robbed. Yeah. He said, you're useless. And I said, well, thanks for the feedback. He went, no, I like you. And anyway, I ended up going out to meet him again. I went to his house. Probably silly. Yeah. But I did. And we chatted. <laughs> and had a laugh about it. And he turns out he is a really nice guy. Mm. Won't speak to me on record. Bit uncomfortable about doing it. But he explained all about his life. Yeah. And he did say to me, listen, you, you're a decent guy, but you're going to have to chill out. Because mm. you can't be that nervous around people. And I said, no, I had flu. I didn't want to interview you. He said, yeah. well, good, I didn't want to be interviewed anyway. Yeah. And I said, and I said, and I just heard that you'd slashed somebody's face with a meat cleaver and that, that one of their arms was hanging off. And he went, <laughs> yeah, he said, I had no idea about that. He said, I haven't done that. So, you it, know, it's, it's um, been confusing. <laughs> those things happen, especially with like, with the stories, how they, um, it's, it's like a, you know, an echo chamber, it goes up. I remember um, one time I heard a story about myself where I'd put someone's head in an oven wow. um, and it had never happened. <laughs> But someone told me about it, how it had gone round and round and it come back to me. Of and course. it's, um, yeah, and they were telling wow. me, like, oh, you put the head in the oven. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that happened, yeah. <laughs> and, just, and it was just, it just, because that, it, once it goes, it goes and it's, you're not in control of it anymore. Yeah, yeah, but was, absolutely. But I can understand that as well, the nervousness of being um, around these people and obviously how it looked as well, because he was probably nervous about being around you. Of course. And because um, I know people in prison who are criminals and they're drug addicts and everything, but they've been beaten up because they've gone to drug places before and they look shifty. They look, you know, the people have thought they were police, so they yes. beat them up. Even when they're not, wow. they're just there to score. 
Um, so oh, it's so um, interesting, yeah. yeah. So that it, it does happen, and it is it is something that that could go from there. So one of the one of the people you've you've spoken to a lot, and you seem to be quite good friends with, um, is the the gangster Dave Courtney. Yes. Now, yeah. how on earth did you become the <laughs> shivering wreck, you know, in the pub with this guy, to becoming quite good friends and spending quite a lot of time with one of Britain's most interesting, notorious and, and well-known gangsters? Well, I mean, I met Dave about eight years ago anyway, so that was before um, Meat Cleaver Gate, as I'd like to call it, you know. <laughs> but I, I, my friend Steve, actually, was by Steve, said to me, oh, you want to come and see this guy at one of his shows? And I said, OK, I didn't know anything about him. Mm. I, I vaguely knew who he was. Yeah. And I went along and it was a, in a pub in Hitchin and everyone was sort of really close knit like this all shoulder to shoulder and I got a lot of apologies from people bumping into me. Mm. That never happens to me because no one <laughs> if you think, cause no one knows who anybody is in that context. So people sort of bang it, bang it, sorry geese, sorry geese. Mm. And at the time I thought, oh, I quite like being called geese, it's quite pleasant. Yeah. You know, you know. And, and, um, and I watched the show and I really liked the show. And there were people on stage, some of his mates there. And I remember looking at a guy who was wearing a cardigan. And I thought at the time, because you can't help judge sometimes, I thought, it's not very gangster. Yeah. A cardigan, are you kidding me? Mm. Then I looked a bit closer, and it was just a cardigan. And then I saw the shape of his physique underneath it. <laughs> and I thought, you can wear whatever you want. He's man. earned the right to wear a cardigan. Yeah, yeah, you can do whatever you like, because you are absolutely rock solid. Yeah. And I watched Dave, and he'd struck me at the time as being a guy who was desperate to be challenged mm. he's an entertainer as well don't forget so he likes people during his one man shows to to ask him he kept saying come on you know ask me a question anything you like mm. and there was a, I went outside during the interval and I wanted to speak to him and at this point I suppose it was part of me if I'm really honest wanted to be able to meet people who were really dangerous because to use a Dave Courtney phrase I could justify meeting me yeah. I figured if I was in the company of people who were really dangerous that maybe I am a real man, this is warped logic, and that I can justify not taking violent revenge against Martha. That's sure. me being very truthful. Yeah. Because if you can sit down and talk to someone who is extremely violent, who could hurt you, and, and you survive, it's yeah. almost like, well, no, I could maybe make the leap from a gibbering rack in yeah. a pub yeah. to, you know, to, to hurting somebody. But, but that, that isn't the case. But I, wa I went outside, and there were various people. There were a couple of youths, outside the archetypal youth which i know is something that's parodied a lot but this is basically how it happened there were two of them one and said yeah mr courtney can i just ask you man i've heard yeah <laughs> that you don't feel pain in the same way that other people don't feel pain you understand you know is it true you don't bleed in the same way and dave went no no that ain't true and then someone how big's your cock dave this woman went <laughs> and he went two inches off the ground and another bloke, how many blokes you killed? He went, I've killed anybody, mate. And the way he was dealing with anyone was really interesting. Yeah. And then, of course, there was timid me. He said, oh, hello, Mr. Courtney. I found that very interesting. And then he said to Brendan, his best mate, who I thought assumed was his bodyguard, turns out he's not. He said, oh, um, take my number, come out to my house. Just like that. Yeah. And and I, I said to Stan, but Steve, I've got his number. And he said, oh, you need to go to his house. He lives in a castle. It is as well, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a large semi-detached house that's but done up as a castle. Yeah. It's got, guess what, pictures of Dave on the side. Yeah. It's a shrine to Dave Courtney, but he says that himself. It's one, you know, Dave Courtney OBE, one big ego. You know, he is an entertainer as well as a whole host of other things. You know, he's, he's, he's the most straightforward and yet complex man I think I've possibly met in my life. And once again, I walked up that hill to go and see him in Plumstead and I thought I was meeting the most dangerous man around mm. and I wanted to prove myself to myself just that I could do it and I've said to him since as well you know if I'd have if I'd have taken people's advice and listened to everything people had said about him I would never have gone yeah. he's on devil worshipping sites apparently yeah he's, he's you a, know. I, I remember reading his books in jail um, I read Stop the Ride and I think the other one was The Ride's Back On mm. um, and from those two books just the way he talks about you know he you know he was the head bouncer for all the clubs in London and things and they used to have you know organized mass brawls with other groups and travelers and and you know there'd be knuckle dusters and weapons mm. and all these kind of things and you just think the guy sounds like you know an old school like um one of those warriors you know yeah. to put in the in the middle of the city yeah um and then there's all the drugs and everything that goes along with it and uh, you know just that lifestyle and 
you know, you read the books and he used to give, he gave the police a key to his door because he was yes. so tired of his door being kicked in every other day. Um, you know? yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then the flamboyancy, you know, the big show trial he had where he turned up as a court jester yeah. Yeah. Um, and everything. And, uh, um, and, and, you know, he, in the books, he gave me some of the advice that I used then later um, when I was going through my court cases and stuff, you know, yeah. how to present yourself, how to present the case, how to yeah. present, you know, yourself in a trial. And it is just, it's a, no matter what, it, I think one of the things he said was no matter what has happened, it's what happens on the day yeah. is, that's decided in court. Um, so, you know, never never write yourself off. <laughs> well, again, you see, I was struck by his wisdom, I think. That, mm. that was what I saw during that show. I thought, oh, I, I don't know what, because I said I enter these situations not knowing what to expect. It's a blessing in some respects, because if you thought, overthought it, it probably wouldn't go to any situation. Yeah. But I just was struck by the wisdom. You know, for example, he said about, all, you know, only use a weapon you're prepared to do the time for. Indeed. And that really stuck with me. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't expect that. I kind of, I don't know what I expected because I went with an open mind. But I think if someone said, right, what is your expectation? I would have said, well, I don't know. He probably beats people with hammers or something, mm -hmm. which would, would not be unreasonable, I suppose, an assumption. But it wasn't that. It was more thoughtful than that. And it was funny. He'd want me to say he's funny. Yeah. But it really was funny. <laughs> but I, I went up there and, I, and I, I was there all day. And we played pool, and he said to me, you know, I, I can read a man very quickly. I know exactly who you are. Which, to be honest, and I've said it to him as well, I was slightly affronted by it at the time. I thought, what do you mean you can tell exactly what I am? That I felt that's a little bit insulting. But anyway, but we had a good time. And he thought, I, you know, he said, no, you're, you're no threat to me, you know. And I went upstairs to have my tarot cards read by his mistress at the time, <laughs> who um, he said to me, oh, she's a good swap at a sex party. And I just remember thinking, yeah, we really are from different worlds because I don't know what that means. I've said, oh, very nice. A good swap, yeah. You know, <laughs> but, but he didn't bat an eyelid because he knew that I wasn't from that world anyway. Yeah. And he has a picture of him on the wall of where he's, he's, he's painted as an angel. And my reason for speaking, I sort of interviewed him and I, and I said, um, I just on my iPhone and I said to him, um, I do have a question. I said, am I a coward? for not taking revenge on the guy who attacked Martha. So once again, I wanted his insight into mm, it. Yeah. You know, and the honesty, uh, an honest insight. And he said to me, turn your phone off. So I did. Which sounds sinister, it's not. Yeah, yeah. He gave me a great piece of advice, which stays between us. Um, and the second thing he said to me was, do you know who I am? And I've told him this since. And he goes, oh, I sound like a right dickhead. If you say, do you know who I am? And that's my impersonation of Dave Courtney, by the way. <laughs> um, and I said, no, but that is what you said. He said, well, I didn't mean it like that. He said, do you know what I am is what I really meant. Mm. And I said, well, I, I'm not going to quibble over semantics, Dave. I said, but you said, do you know who I am? Which well, you did. And I said, well, no, not really. And I didn't want to say, well, I've heard you, you're a devil worshipper. Because that seemed a bit yeah. too forward, even though I've been there for eight hours. And he said, well, you've been up at my house all day. People have been coming and going. You don't know who any of them are. He said, and you're scared. And I went, of course. Mm. You know, of course I'm scared. I don't know what I'm doing. He says, weapons on the wall. I mean, they're all decommissioned, but that's not the point. Mm. He, you know, and he said, you've probably never seen a knuckle duster before. You've had your tarot cards read. You've been <laughs> speaking to my mates. I spoke to you, entertained you. And this, that, and the other. You're scared, and you're still here. He said, we never have to talk about you being a coward again. Mm. And I, I and I walked back down that hill thinking to myself, remembering that. And I thought, I'm really so happy that you told me that. I needed to hear that. Even then, at that point, I needed, needed to hear it. And it meant a lot to me. Um, because I thought the world's most dangerous man had told me that I was not a coward. Exactly. And I needed to hear it. And I walked down. I remember thinking, is this the criminal underworld? Mm. Why does he have a sex dungeon at the bottom of his garden? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> You know, why has a dominatrix walked in and sort of they've just spoken quite openly about her day, about what's going on? Oh, God, I've got to do another cock and ball torture. You know, and, and, and why did it just seem all so normal? Yeah, why isn't and, anybody else? You yeah, know, no, no one else is freaked out by it. <laughs> and, and, I, and I'm quite comfortable with it, and I seemed like they're all right. And I remember I got back and I said, Martha said, how was it? And I went, yeah, it was really interesting, you know. I, I, I think I liked them. I said, but I, I, I have no idea what the hell I've just seen. Yeah. And then he phoned me the day after and said, do you want to come back up? And I said, all right. And I've been going ever since. No, I, I find it interesting. I, I, I touched on it a minute ago. 
um, about the, the bravery and the, the you feeling like a coward mm. um, and you've just gone on that journey that you have and walk in with those people that you have because that is not a cowardly thing to be doing. Um, no. you know, a coward sits at home, curtains shut, hide in, you know, you would, yeah. you know, and, and, and being afraid, you know, even Martha was brave and carried on doing her work and everything else. And like, oh, you know, yeah. that, the, 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 the painter you're pitching, you know, the, the, you know, the cowardless is only in your mind, you know, and that's yeah. possibly because, you know, that's what you're the inwardly thinking about yourself. I mean, mm. but the stuff you're doing isn't cowardly or, you know, not brave in the slightest. Well, I'll tell you something about Martha. I'm going to add this because, because sometimes people ask me about Martha and the guy lived above her for two more years. That's insane. And obviously he was still dealing. He got warned off of that. I don't actually know what happened to him because yeah. I've let go of it. I don't. I haven't forgiven him. And I'm not going to forgive him, but I just don't care about him. It doesn't matter. Yeah. But um, he came. He he came down. She was making falafel, <laughs> <laughs> and um, the smoke alarm went off, and she, he came downstairs and knocked on her door. I've got a baby upstairs, and blah 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 blah, and and she chased him up the stairs, and she actually said to him, "Well, come on then, let's go." Yeah. And, and she, she said, you nearly killed me and I'm just not afraid of you anymore. So why don't you actually do it? And, and he ran off yeah. and her neighbor said, what was that? And she said, I just told the hardest man in the village to go and fuck himself. Yeah. And she said it was a real moment and word got around mm. that, that this tiny woman had stood up to this guy and then suddenly it was like, ah, right. And things changed after wow. that. Things definitely changed after that. I mean, he left, I don't know why he left. But he ended up moving still somewhere else on the on the scheme or the estate as they call it. But it wasn't the same for him after that point. And she and she she got a lot braver. He damaged her self esteem. I know it did. It damaged course, mine. Yeah. But she, I know that she that that she she said I'm just not afraid of violence anymore. Mm. And what this journey has done for me, I think, is that it's by meeting people who have been violent and getting their perspectives on it it's helped me to make my peace with violence and it's helped me to sort of to not be afraid of it anymore no indeed and, and, and that's great and that doesn't mean I'm not sort of saying well come and have a go if you think you're hard enough <laughs> I don't mean that I'm saying listen if you think you're hard enough you probably are yeah. but I, I just I feel better about it. I'm not afraid everywhere I go I'm not worried it's going to kick off yeah you know because of course it can kick off yes it has kicked off you know I'm, I'm, at times but I'm it doesn't I'm not scared anymore and I'm not scared to walk away from any situation I might find myself in and that feels a lot better and the whole journey basically for me has been very much that if you're afraid of something i.e. crime and violence and you confront it even the little insights that I have from people which actually can be monumental at times that help that really helps me to not be scared of it because yeah. you've just got more of an understanding yeah sure you know so, I mean, other than sort of Courtney and, and the other guys you've spoken to, who who have you found sort of most interesting from um, you know from you know from the stories? Because obviously, there's the, the I really liked the prostitute lady. Yeah, I like the her. one who um, you know you don't oh. have, the good one doesn't sleep with people. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then there was the guy, the hammer guy as well. Um, oh was, yeah, he was brilliant. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah, I mean, who who have you found most interesting? Um, well, or, or, I, or, or most insightful, possibly. I actually love all of them because they're each each one. Is, has been such a sort of a personal achievement. Yeah. When I listen back, mm. you know, like when you listen back to your own stuff, you, you, you'll you think, wow, that, that I'm hoping you listen back, oh, that was really, that just came over so well. And it's hard to pick a favourite. I think, I th one thing I would say, the armed robbers are quite interesting because as you know, in jail, they seem to have quite a lot of respect. Mm. And I don't know why that is exactly. I th it, maybe it's because of the length of sentence that they do. It also takes a lot of bottle to do that. Like yeah. it's quite easy to sort of mug somebody or something yeah. like that. But to then go, like to penetrate something, to arm, mm. to armed robbery is another level. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's yeah, there is, there is almost like a ladder of crime. Yeah. Um, oh, so, well, you know, that. there's the petty thieves, the late the grandma robbers and that sort of thing. And then there's the, you know the you know the thieves, the drug dealers, and then armed robbers go up there, and then murderers up on top. You know, something. yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> so, absolutely. Um, yeah, so being been on the wing with lifers and things is a real leveler because you know you're on a wing sometimes with someone who's been in there twenty years, yeah. um, and they may have been around different prisons and things. They're you know they've grown old in prison. Yeah, um, they don't care. There's nothing. There's nothing that they can have taken away from them um, because yeah. they're already spending the rest of their life in jail. Wow, and uh, that's amazing. I remember speaking to one guy, and he telling me about how he'd done a tour of like mental hospitals because he got bored. He knew he was spending the rest of the time in jail, so he just he started acting up, acted insane, got himself put in Broadmoor, and spent a few years in Broadmoor just getting drugged up out of his eyeballs, um, acting mental. I did, <laughs> I did a gig there. 
You have you really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Yeah, I did a gig at Broadmoor, but I, I think in t in terms of everyone is everyone I've met has offered me something really interesting, and and that and that I promise you isn't sort of a trite answer. Hmm. Genuinely, everyone I've met, I thought, wow, I really learned from that, and and, that, and that's great. Yeah. Because because that that's the one thing as well. You know, I I had no idea of the journey that people have been on. It's very easy to kind of go, oh, yeah, all criminals are the same. That couldn't be further from the truth. Exactly. And and how people cut, and we're all, the one thing I have in common with the people I've spoken to is I'm coming to terms with crime. Yeah. And they're coming to terms with crime as well. Because 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 you have to, yeah. right? You, know, you look back on it and you reflect upon things. And all right, it, it's from a different perspective, but we're all, in a way, suffering from from the consequences of crime. Indeed. So, so getting those perspectives have been really has been really really good for me, and you know I've I always go I've just always gone along with an open mind. I have to say, um, Frank Portinari probably um, surprised me mm. because on paper, it, it, he shouldn't be a good person. He shouldn't be a good guy yeah. or an interesting guy. He should be too scary to speak to. Yeah, Frank. I mean, he's from North London, and he was a football hooligan. His words, not mine. <laughs> he was a member of the National Front. That's difficult, yeah. You know, and he went to jail for supplying guns, and he was the commander of the London UDA, Ulster Defence Association. <laughs> so, wow, that that that's quite heavy. Yeah. But I read his book before, you know, a couple of days before I interviewed him. I thought, wow, I'm definitely, uh, yeah, a couple of days before I think, and I and I thought I have, to, I'm doing the right thing speaking to this guy. I absolutely need to speak to him. And I did, and I'm glad. And I suppose he surprised me. But everyone surprised me in their own way, yeah. I think is what I'm trying to say. Mm. And so, so that's been good. And everyone has offered me an insight that's been really valuable. And even the woman in Spain, Paula, I mean, I knew within 30 seconds of meeting her, I thought, yeah, you are the real deal. I know you are. <laughs> she imported, I think she said, 30 tonnes of hash. Wow. You know, and, and, that, and that's quite a lot. Right? That is a lot, yeah. And that wasn't even what she got sent down for. Mm. You know, and, and she said, oh, no, there was bribed policemen and judges everybody got done yeah. and she was running running I say running but she she well no she said in her own words I walked into Allerin prison maximum security prison and I thought ah I fucking own this place yeah and she did P pretty pretty much she actually got her husband to bring in drugs in the um in the cavity in his in his chest where he'd had a pacemaker <laughs> put in and she said she, he brought me in a mobile phone but he bought the charger as well I could have killed him she said and I was like wow but, but, she, but she was the real deal but it was interesting and with her because I think she's made a lot of money from crime yeah and it's quite comfortable she's had a great time mm. and I still think she's not active but she knows what's going on over there and she's you know so, so crime has worked out for her yeah but even hearing that was interesting yeah, so to all these perspectives have just been invaluable to me because it's because nothing is, is cut and dried and nothing is entirely straightforward and even with violence as I said to you you know like not everybody's violent. No, no, indeed. And that's comforting. Mm. I mean, one one of the things that I found from doing this is um, when I spoke to you, I I just assumed that it'd be just true crime fans who would like it. Mm. Um, and one of the things that I found that the people listening to it is it's all walks of life. So yeah. you know, you've got true crime fans, you've got people who are, who are going through a similar situation. So yeah. their friends and family might be you know in crime or into you know you know getting falsely arrested, um, things like this. I've you know I've had a mum listening to it whose son's just gone to jail. You know, just listening for a bit of insight into, yeah. the, into what's going on and things. So, um, yeah, just the you know the different um, the spectrum of people that are interested in this kind of stuff. Oh, very much um, so. Yeah, and but also the people who've lived it as well. Mm. as such a broad spectrum. I mean, because every person you spoke to has been different, haven't you? You know, it's not just been a similar set of people, or you know. Yeah, very um, much so. Sometimes the accents are the same because yeah. all the accents, <laughs> but 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 actually, yeah, I think mostly the experiences have been have been very different and that and that's what I've enjoyed about it as well. Was there anything that really surprised you? Was there anything that you thought when you went to an interview that you thought it was going to go one way and then it was just something completely else? Um, well, I mean, D Dave Courtney was completely unexpected because, you know, I've never met him. There will probably never, ever be another Dave Courtney. No. I, I wouldn't have thought. Um, the interview, I was in Moscow, actually, doing some gigs over there and he says quite casually like it happens all the time. But, but I was in Russia doing some gigs and I went to, to Moscow, arranged an interview with a guy who cancelled last minute mm. and I thought, oh God, this isn't going to go well. But I met another guy, an Arab guy I was chatting to and he said, oh, 
see I am braver than I thought I know <laughs> he said to me why don't you come and speak to my housemate she'll tell you all about drugs in Russia mm. so I went <laughs> yeah, again that's not a normal thing to do <laughs> like, that's not it's something ridiculous that, yeah. isn't it? I, I seriously I, you know yeah yeah I, that's, that's idiotic isn't it so I you know so I met him I, he told me what bus to get I got the underground and then and then he met me and we went on the bus and he said okay this is a very old building um, it used to be a brothel years ago it's all right so it might be a bit weird when you get in yeah. and we went in and she was half French half Italian from London was a ketamine dealer and she told me all about sort of crime and how it works and how drugs work on the dark web yeah. in Russia but that was unexpected yeah and I, I don't drink anymore, but I sat there getting quietly pissed with her. <laughs> and so I was hammered by the end of it. I, yeah. I thought, and she said, oh, that was it. She said, I, I talked to you for half an hour. And I thought, great. But then her boyfriend, for whatever reason, she, she, she was going to meet, couldn't, cancel for some reason. I think it something come up. And she said, look, I'm free all evening now. So I stayed and chatted to the pair of them. And he's on his shisha pipe, this Arab guy in the background so that's a little bit surreal because yeah. he's hauling on this shisha pipe and we're just chatting away and you can hear me getting progressively more and more drunk <laughs> but I got sort of about three hours of footage and I was absolutely hammered and and he to, to, to his credit he took me we, he walked me back to the station because I wouldn't have found it by myself yeah and and then I somehow found it I got got back to got on the on the underground got back to wherever found back found where I was staying I don't know how I managed to find where I was staying and just sort of went to bed and woke up the following day terrible hangover gotcha. thinking my god that was weird and then listened back to it because I thought oh, I did press record that that's great so that was unexpected but they all are because because you never quite know I spoke to a dominatrix you know who was really interesting who told me about um you know how she had sex with a guy who had no arms and no legs Oh, wow, pillow man. <laughs> it was brilliant, just brilliant. So they've all been. I I found the whole thing, you know, well delightful. Yeah. Weirdly, but but I think I think that's probably good. I don't know. I'd like to think that that's probably the right attitude to have. It's better than um, regretting it or not. You know, speaking to people who, you know, possibly have just thought this isn't. You know, this isn't because. Um, Again, you haven't wanted to speak to active criminals, really, have you? Um, well, uh, that that's kind of a no use to me. It's interesting. <coughs> I've spoken to some off record. Yeah. And and by off record, I've been very upfront. I'm always upfront about who I am. I go, look, yeah. you know, I do a po comic by trade, and they go, you don't look funny. And I go, oh, there we go again. <laughs> you know, I don't know what I have to do to convince you. Um, and and I go, I do a podcast. Oh yeah, I do a podcast. All right. And I'm just interviewing people, and um, and the active ones they will talk to me because some people have said look some people have agreed to an interview and they've gone look I, I can't I'm sorry I can't do it I'm yeah. like okay that's absolutely fine but yeah. I will chat to you yeah and they'll chat and they'll tell me stuff and I always appreciate that as well so mm -hmm. and then um so there was a guy recently a young guy in mid-20s who said to me um he said oh I've heard about what you're doing he said you know and, and he wasn't even volunteering information particularly. He said, you know, he said, uh, good on you for doing it. He said, do you know when I wake up every day, I don't think, oh, I'm a criminal. Mm. He said, I wake up and I think, oh, how am I going to get through today? Mm. You know, he said, and so sometimes I'll do what people would call crime. He said, because it is crime. He said, but I'm not strutting around thinking as I'm doing it, I'm a criminal, I'm a criminal. Mm. He said, I do things. And I don't, didn't even ask what it was that he did. I have an idea of what he's up to. <laughs> you know but I didn't didn't really delve and he said the thing is I could take you down the road now to meet a crack dealer and it's only about three weeks ago he said it to me he said and, um, you could meet him he goes but his question would be do you want to buy any crack yeah <laughs> he said his second question would be why don't you want to buy any crack yeah. <laughs> and I went oh and he said so what do you want to go and speak to him for yeah he goes, and actually, you might be looking, there's a chance that you might be looking for an insight into something that doesn't actually exist. Mm. He said, consider that as a possibility. And I said, thank you, I will. And yeah. it was an interesting perspective once again. That's it. So not everybody has a story that, you know, is worth telling or is interesting. Well, well, or maybe they're just a horrible person. Yeah. Well, well, maybe. Who knows? But in everyday life, not everyone has an interesting story. Some yeah. people will swear blind. No, I'm the most tedious man in the world. I just go to work. I do this. I do that. And, and that's it. I, I want to keep myself to myself. Yeah. So so there's no, there's not a bad thing, but I've been lucky 
in that I've met people who have told me fascinating stories, shared their lives with me. You know, told some some people have said, yeah, I've told you stuff that, that you know that uh, didn't think I was going to even talk about. Yeah, but I've always been very respectful. Mm. Well, and, I, know, you know, I know when you spoke to me. I mean, it was because um, I did. I did, like I say, I did an interview with you. And uh, it was the whole reason I started doing this because yeah. you know, like you said, it was it, you know it, it was it was fairly well accepted, and uh, it just made me think. Then I'll diarise what I did, you know, the, in the entirety because uh, just speaking to you, I realised oh, I missed out this story and I missed yeah. out that story, and because we you know it's condensed down into it was it was an hour, but it's still yeah. you know it's an hour of ten years, and I was just, oh absolutely so yeah, yeah. so I, I, you know once I went through it, I realised you know different experiences I had, and it, it was actually quite difficult to recount some of it because you're taking yourself back there and you're describing situations that are really difficult. Yeah. And I realised quickly that I could either go down the road road of glamorising it and talking shit and, I'm, you know, I'm the big guy and I, I won this fight and I beat this guy up and did yeah. this. But it's more relatable if you just said, oh, actually, I found it, you know, deeply miserable. Yeah. And I had to fight sometimes. Yeah. Um, the rest of the time I was wishing I wasn't there. Yeah. Um, I said quite openly within the first couple of weeks, if someone had come and just said, open the door and gone, did you really want this? You know, if you get out and never commit crime again, we'll let you go now. I would have held my hands up and gone, I will never do anything again if you let yeah. me out now. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's brave to admit that, I yeah. think, as well. Because a, a lot of people in there, and you see them just still talking shit. I mean, I've, I've you know, I've you know, had plenty of people in the comments even saying, it's obvious he's reading from a book and he doesn't even credit them. And it's just like, I'm talking about my own experiences. Wow. And, but, and it's, it's just, it's, oh, you know, that's it's just the bizarre. internet for you, though, isn't it? I know, it? it's insane. Um, and then you get other guys, like I say, there's just been so much interest in sort of back and forth in the comments yeah. and stuff. But it's, um, if you, if you feel like now, so do you think that if you ended, ever ended up in prison for whatever reason, mm. um, do you, how do you feel you would you would you know live, survive, cope, that sort of thing? That's I mean, a great question, that is, isn't it? I mean, I'd I'd like to think that I that I, that I would that would be a happy ending to it, and I'd do like a, a happy so ending is probably the wrong wrong. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah probably. Well, I think it would end well. Yeah, and that I would um I maybe do a psychology degree or something, and then come out. Like John McVicker did, you know, like yeah. an expert in, um, like a PhD in, well, he did sociology, I believe. But, mm. you know, maybe I do criminology or something like that. Yeah. Or I'll end up a criminal mastermind. That's but it. no, I, 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 no, do you know what? I don't know. I think it's the sort of thing that you don't know until you're faced with it. Indeed. And, and, but that is, but here's the thing. Do you know something I find interesting as well? I, I learn in retrospect. So I, it takes me ages to learn things sometimes. Mm. I was about 20 years old, a long time ago now. I was in Bath, or Bath, as, as the posh people call it. I was at a hostel. Yeah. There was a guy there from America who was a prison officer who just quit. Mm. And he was traveling the world. And I, and I said to him, I've got to ask you, why, why have you quit? And he said, ah, oh. he said, well, he said, oh. so I used to watch these guys playing basketball. He said, every day. He said, they were brilliant. Mm. They were so good. He said, tall, athletic black guys playing yeah. in the yard. He said, who were doing the most amazing slam dunks like you see on the telly. Yeah. He said, and I looked at them and I thought, God, I'll never be you. I wanted to do that <laughs> and I'll never be you. He said, and I just looked at them and I thought, he said, I thought, it's such a shame that you've wasted your potential. Yeah, and 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 he didn't mean it in a stuck-up way. It's yeah. very easy to say that that could sound patronising, but he didn't mean that. I don't think. I like I like to think he didn't. But at the time, I didn't really understand what he meant by that. But now I kind of do. Mm. And having met people who've been to jail, I'm not saying you've all wasted your lives. I, I wouldn't say that for a second. But there's a lot of very talented people who do time, yeah. who lose their way. And I'm always fascinated and humbled by the fact that they can put it behind them and then go out and do something amazing. Mm. And it's brilliant. And that's been possibly the most unexpected part of the journey in a way for a man who didn't have any expectations. You know, and there's, there's people with an awful lot of potential who, you know, maybe they reach a certain part of a point in their life and they think, oh, actually, I'm going to do this now and they yeah. can do it. Mm. So, you know, I, I think that you don't know until you're faced with something. If I went to jail, I'd like to think that I would be able to survive. Yeah. I don't know if any of the knowledge that I've gained or experiences would help me or whether I'd have to start from the bottom like everybody else has to. Yeah. But I just, I, I think that I certainly wouldn't go in there underestimating anybody. Mm. And I mean absolutely nobody at all. But I also like to think that I come out the end of it um, having learned a lesson and, and maybe 
maybe would try and improve myself somehow. I don't know. Mm. I, I hope. I hope that. I hope I'm trying to. I'm sort of trying to say that. I suppose I'm trying to say that I don't know really. I don't know how I'd cope, but I would certainly try. And I've been, you know, hugely inspired by the people who have been on that journey. As I said, and it would be a shame to go to jail. Yeah. So that, that that that's one thing about it as well. I. I, I wouldn't want to and, and I've met various people who've like one guy said to me so do you want me to there wasn't someone I was technically interviewing he said so, so are you here because you want me to arrange to beat up the guy who attacked your missus mm. and I said oh no no thank you <laughs> you know I think he'd offer me some olives or something yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. and, and he, he actually hugged me and he said he said well done mm. He said, it's not, it's not really you, is it? I said, no, it's not me, mate. I'm just trying to make sense and trying to understand, try, trying to understand people. And, and that's it. So I'm kind of, one thing the journey has given me is I'm glad, I'm glad that I didn't go to jail. I'm glad I didn't hurt somebody. Yeah. You know, it doesn't make me better, hmm. but there's plenty of people who have had the experience yeah. of going to jail who've actually said, actually, you haven't really missed out on it, mate. No. You know, it's, it's, and I'm no better than anybody. But I'm just. But I'm glad that I haven't. And I suppose people have, have, have said, no, you've done, you've done the right thing. Just yeah, carry on living your life. One hundred percent. And and again, like I say, I'd, I'd sit here and I, I, personally, I don't know how you've done it. And I, I would have been eaten alive by it. But that's me and my oh, circumstances. Alone. I was, but as I said, yeah. That's because I'm a hothead, and I, again, from growing up in Portland, so I, I, I do look at myself as wasting my life. I know that I spent from eighteen to twenty eight in prison, yeah. um, and that's the time when you should be making your little mistakes outside, going on your little 18 to 30 parties and stuff, yeah. and you know, college, uni, that sort of thing. And I didn't do any of that, I did prison instead. Yeah. Um, so you know, a lot of the DNA and how I act now is based on how I was treated then. Yeah. Um, and it's, um, yeah, so I, I think you'd be okay. I think as, uh, as, as Courtney said to you, you'd end up either just hiding away in yourself for a little bit, getting yourself a book. Yeah. And, uh, but you'd, you'd, you'd probably end up with a bunch of guys who are similar to you. Yeah. As in, you know, you shouldn't really be in prison, but you've ended up here. Yes. You know, so um, that's, yeah. uh, I think you'd be, I think you would be okay. <laughs> but see, I think, I think to go back to the, what the prison officer said, you know, the retired prison officer said about wasted potential. I look at the people I've met and I think, no, you haven't wasted it. Or, or maybe you feel you have, and that's perfectly valid to say that. Of course, it's your experience. Yeah. But I also think, no, actually, you've got loads of skills well, that yeah. you've learned as well. It's just I mean, a different path, yeah. Yeah, but, and, and also, but the thing is this, if you can run a prison shop, mm. then you can be a team leader of a retail outlet. If you know, I, I don't know exactly. what I'm trying to say. You know, I've I, I looked at it from a business plan point of yeah, view. Yeah, that's what I mean. every, Everything I would have done as a drug dealer, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm sourcing a supplier. I'm getting a good deal. That's what I mean. Finding customers, yeah. um, making sure your yeah. product is at the right price to, for you to make money and yeah. still be viable. Yeah. You know, so it's it's all skills that you just then transfer into the real world. Yeah, it is. Um, and, and, and that's not romanticising it. That, that that's just a fact that if you can go through that, it's all, yeah. And and I think I think that's what the guy meant. That's what I want to think the prison officer meant was that yeah, yeah that that actually these guys have so much potential you could do anything you do loads of stuff yeah if you if you if you can i believe i used to be fascinated by the french foreign legion mm. who um that you're, you're not allowed to join if you're gay a psychopath or french <laughs> <laughs> don't quote me on that but but someone did so if you can steal a car then you can drive a tank yeah so and that could sound a bit wishy-washy liberal me saying oh no you all have potential but i really believe that you know, I think that I think that there's people even even if you have a lot of aggression and you, you it can be misplaced. Yeah, I mean, you, you can channel that into something else. I'm not. I don't know how you do it. I've always thought that a lot of people should be there should be an option halfway through your sentence to maybe join the army. Yeah. Um. You know, because there's a lot of people in there who have aggression that they fight every weekend. They're normal yeah. guys who just go out and kick people's heads in at the weekend. Yeah, absolutely. And um. Isn't that what the army wants? You know, people who indiscriminately kick people's heads in, yeah. send, send them off the war. Yeah, well, well con <laughs> controlled, controlled yeah. aggression. Exactly. Because the army can train people to do anything. Exactly. If, if you have the aptitude for yeah. it, you know. So it, it it could it could be. And I think something uh, something like that would have I would have jumped at the chance of also is if they say right halfway through your sentence you go off to a, a prison army camp where you can you know you go and get beasted yeah. and get put into shape and then you know end up you know going off and doing something productive with all this misplaced energy yeah absolutely um, yeah and, and 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 that's it as well so i've you know so yeah i've just hearing hearing so many different perspectives yeah has been great for me mm. i've that that's what i've enjoyed 
and I said they they all they all mean something. They've all you know ev every single one of them has meant something. Fantastic. And and that that is great. And at some point, I'll get through my list of people I want to speak to, and I'll never say never, but I can then kind of walk away from it. Mm. And, so do you, you feel know, like the the journey you've gone through with these with these criminals? Do you feel like that's helped you then? with the, the, the you know the reason you went on that path so that you know the whole martha being attacked is... yeah undoubtedly yeah yeah it is because because i understand a lot more about myself and and as i said the fact that not everybody not even you know, not all criminals are violent far from it yeah some some people in some people will get their mate to go and beat somebody up mm. and so so that takes the nobility yeah out of it in a way I get it. It's quite practical as well. If, yeah. if you know, if, if you don't like fighting, but your mate loves it, well, go and bite his face off, mate, and I'll I'll go and do something else. Yeah. So, but but the fact that not everybody likes to fight that that really surprised me. Mm. And that out of those people who do fight, I mean, Freddie Foreman. I met Freddie Foreman, and he said, "Oh, yeah, I had a straightener on the cobbles. It wasn't very straight." <laughs> he said, oh, "I hit him when he wasn't looking." He said, and then he, <laughs> he said, "He's a lovely guy. <laughs> he really made me laugh." And he, he said, and his head sort of hit the tarmac and I, I sort of legged it, you know, and he said, because yeah. he, he was massive. And he said, so I wasn't going to be straight. <laughs> he said, and in the end I thought, no, oh, he said, yeah, I, you know, he ended up, the guy ended up going to hospital. He said, and I was worried that it was, uh, you know, that, that he was going to die. And I thought, no, I won't have, I'm, none of these straighteners have to stop now. Yeah. So Fred Foreman, mm. the godfather, or you know, one of the godfathers of British crime says, oh no, I don't really like fighting. <laughs> Not quite like that. Yeah. But then, then it's all right for me. Yeah. When when it's not my job. Exactly. It's not part of my trade. Yeah. I mean, I'm an entertainer as well. You know, you wouldn't think it. I, but I genuinely funny. You know. No, that's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> I genuinely don't. <laughs> so, but um, but so so it, it's just not part of my life. Indeed. And nor should it be. So are you going to plan to do some more of these uh, conversations with criminals? I, absolutely, yeah. I've, yeah. I have a few, I have a few people who I'm sort of, who I'm approaching, and and I will. I don't know how many there'll be. There might be half a dozen more. Yeah. It, it's it's it, the journey's sort of coming to the end for me, and that's not a negative thing at all. It just I'll have a body of work, and a couple of years of memories that mean a huge amount. Yeah. You know, I don't. I don't go on holiday, so I don't have any holiday snaps. <laughs> so, so I'll I'll have that, and even little things. You know, just even like the armed robber from um, from Glasgow, who I went to his flat, and he t he showed me his gun. He took his gun out, and um, and I just said, "Would oh, you mind putting that away, please?" <laughs> and he said, "Oh no, no, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna shoot you." He said, "I'm just showing you what I've got for personal protection." Wow. And then and then he said to me, "Look, do you want to be tasered? Because it'd probably be quite good for, as part of your research." We haven't kept in touch, <laughs> but but it's still valuable, <laughs> and um, again, that's that's beyond the realms of most people, isn't it? As well, that's so stupid. Do you know? I've, do you know what I've learned from this? What's that? I think I might be a lot braver than I realise. I think you may be. I think the, the, the person you're describing isn't the person you think you are, um, and I don't think I'm talking myself up. No, I hope no. not. But like I said, the, the things you're doing are very brave, and the, the circles you're mixing in are very. A deep waters. <laughs> yeah, they probably are. Well, which might be why I need to sort of swim to the shallow end yeah. <laughs> and just put my towel on and get out, and that'll be that. Have you got a wish list? Is there anybody that you, you know, if the, you know, there might be a top three of people if you could interview them? Um, yeah, the, the, there are a few actually. I, I would very much, and I, and I do know him as well. I'd really like to speak to Tony Sales because he's a very insightful guy who, you know, has been hasn't been involved in crime for many years now but he was a, a con man yeah essentially and really has such a great understanding of social engineering and the first few times i met him i thought what is it about you mm. i couldn't work it out and now i know what it is his brain is just working all the time he's such a clever guy you know and he and, he, and he's just this, this very fascinating mix of streetwise yeah but can also speak to people in the corporate world mm. about how to stop hackers from ruining their internet. Fantastic. So you know, so that that's such an interesting thing for me. I'd also I would actually like to speak to Marvin Herbert. Really? Yes, I would. I'll tell you why. I have very specific questions for him that I, I'm not going to go as far as he's. You know, I'm not Princess Leia, and he's not Obi Wan mm. Kenobi. Yeah. But 
there are certain things that I really want to ask him yeah. about violence. Sure. I don't think that'd be difficult to get him to talk. <laughs> no, no, probably won't. No, absolutely not. But, but, I, but I would like to speak to him. And I don't know whether I'll be able to. He's very much in demand. You know, I've heard, I've heard his story. And there's no trick. I don't, you know, I'm not, there's yeah. no subtext to me. I don't trick anybody or anything like that. But there's very specific questions that I would like to ask to ask him. Yeah. And who else? Th th those two for definite. Um, I've set one up with a with an older guy who was around um, post war. He would have been about eight, I think, um, when the war ended, mm. and he was involved in crime then. Yeah. And has quite a lot to say about the various, well, the craze and various people. So he'll be interesting to talk to. See, I love the craze. Um, I was listening to something, I was listening to a podcast the other day about them. And the lady who was talking about them tried to describe them as, as fairly pathetic people, really. Um, right. Because they still lived at home with their mum. Right. Um, and, you know, they never really left the boundaries. They did all this and that. And even the, even the celebrities they surrounded themselves with um, were kind of you know, the down and out ones, the mm. ones who kind of needed the attention as well. Yeah. Um, so they, um, they weren't really mixed. They were, it was all kind of very produced. Right. Um, obviously, they were very violent. You know, yeah. they, they, did, they did what they did. There's no, there's no denying that. But it was the, the internal conversation that they were having with themselves was quite a pathetic one, almost. It was like, you know, yeah. they, were quite, they were quite sad people. And, yeah. but, and then used the violence to push themselves up mm. and beyond. Um, because if you think about it, yeah, they weren't living in a mansion. They didn't have like, you know, Courtney had a big picture on the wall. Yeah. They, just, they lived by making everyone afraid of them. Yes, and yeah. then you know, still went home to their mum and stuff, and and you know, it's just bizarre. But again, they're just these these are the walks of life, you know. The, you know, the variations of the you know. I don't think you would have. I don't know. I mean, just from my experience, I don't know if they would have been. You would have liked being around them as much. They just seemed like more out and out bullies. Yeah, yeah, there is that. I mean, uh, yes, I'm trying to. I'm trying to think if there's anyone I haven't liked. Certainly, I've liked everyone who I've interviewed. Yeah, um, and I've liked most of the people. There, there are some people who are just scary, yeah, and you just think, yeah. and you and you just and you just think, no, mm. you know, and it's all very well l looking for the, you know, for for the best in somebody, but when you think, <laughs> no, no, yeah. you you are twenty plus stone mm. of of steroids and and probably coke, and you could snap my neck, yeah, I'm not going to ask you about your childhood. There's just no point. I'll just move on. <laughs> it, it's it's fine, and 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 that. So that so there are boundaries with it, yeah. But but for the most part, no, I've 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 actually really 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 enjoyed it and found it utterly fascinating and compelling, and inspiring as well, and yeah. But only a hand. But then it's like any walk of life. There's always there's always one or two people you're going to think, oh no, I I don't like the look of you. I don't like the vibe. It's all about energy, isn't it? Really, because yeah, because we're dealing with people for the most. Well, we are people. So there's a whole broad spectrum of people, and very very occasionally, I did have a guy actually who ended up. Going back to jail, one right. of my guests. Yeah, yeah. but um, was it the, one of the ones that actually you interviewed? Yeah, 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 yeah interviewed him back in jail. Was it for the similar sort of thing you'd expect him to um, be doing? He, well, he was an addict. Ah, okay. You know, and um, and Terry Ellis, a guy, a very very interesting man actually, um, ex armed robber, went to Grendon, which is a controversial process therapeutic prison. Yeah. He phoned me actually because he knew about the guy, you know, who went back to prison. He said, "Look," he said, "It's not it's not your fault." No. He said he, he's addicted to crack. He said, and that is more important than anything else. He said, and anyone can get addicted to crack. Yeah. You know, he said, you just have to take this one and just accept it happens. And I was, oh, yeah, no, it's fine. It's not going to put me off yeah. speaking yeah. to people, nor, nor should it. No. Because on the day we met, he was, he was very interesting to speak to. I still learned a lot from it. Yeah. And that's something I've found, actually, because I always, I, I, I said towards the beginning of me doing my podcast that I'm not that person anymore. Yeah. Um, and what I found is I am that person. I'm just choosing not to act in that way anymore. Yeah, that's um, interesting. And because wow. to, for me to be able to, you know, because it, it's wrong for me to keep saying I'm not that person when I keep acting in the same way, but I'm having to hold back or I'm conflicted and things like yeah. this. So I am still that person I was in prison. I'm just choosing not to act that way anymore. Yes. Yeah, um, that makes sense. And that's the best way I've found of looking at it without being too kind of um, schizophrenic about it. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I know what you mean. Um, no, no, I think that, that that's good, though. That, that's a great assessment. But I think yeah. if you, but for you to get to that place, it, it, it's it's quite a long journey, I think, to get mm. there, isn't it? To be able to articulate that and mm -hmm. to sort of accept it in a way is a very... You know, I, I, and I find that really interesting, yeah. you see. And that's something I have to thank you for, because without me doing the podcast with you and then realising that I'd condensed it and, and kind of 
not glamorized it so much but i tried to tell you the kind of the, the, the version that I like to portray yeah oh um, yeah yeah but we all do that though. yeah and as soon as I started to I mean because it wasn't even sugar-coated was it? I told you about getting bullied and things yeah. like this I mean it, was, it wasn't you know all bravado but it was I did find afterwards that um, when I looked back I'd been lying to myself about some of the times in prison yeah. and when I diarised it and actually broke it down into a timeline I realised that most of it I was miserable you know there was you know maybe out of the ten years there was two years of it I was mm. happy and just having a laugh and, and fucking around and those two years were towards the end of the prison time. Yes, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> um, so it was, yeah, it was something that, uh, yeah, it was therapeutic for me, made me realise why I act the way I do, why I kick off and try and dominate people is because that's how I had to be in Portland. Yeah. So that was the, the set of, you know, rules that I had to live by there and it just doesn't work on the outside and you end up being this lunatic, mental, having breakdowns, you know. <laughs> well, yeah, um, yeah, I, of course. And, and it must be, I, I think, I forget how you express it to me, but it, just the idea that, hang on, if, you, if you're working in a, in a conventional job, whatever that is, or you're, or you're working and you're not involved with crime and you're just working normally, yeah. um, if there is such a thing, you, you can't really be chasing some, or have someone phone you up at four in the morning and mm. say, look, I've been robbed. Can you come and beat someone up for me? Because you're like, well, no, I've got to be up at seven. And that, that actually happened to me when I was at work. <laughs> and my phone was blowing up and I was, you know, and I got him and he was just saying, no, he, you know, he'd been punched in the face by this guy. And he was like, come on, we're going to need to go and sort him out. And I was like, well, we need to do that after five o'clock. You know? <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. No, I, can't, I can't just yeah. walk out of work. Well, before I'd have been like, you wait there, I'm coming right now. Uh, absolutely. Um, and I would have loved it. And, you know, I, I, I enjoyed being that guy and I enjoyed always putting my hand up and saying, I will do it. You know, because yeah. um, one of the things I got caught for, you know, and, and you know, nearly got the life sentence for was because someone needed a debt collecting, and I just said I'll yeah. do it. Yeah. And I mean, and as stupid as it was, I was always that guy because I wanted the props, I wanted the the reputation, yeah. I wanted people to think, you know, Adam, um, he's a lunatic. Yeah. You know, so. Um, yeah, but see, I can kind of understand that as mm. well because because you can't you can't really play at crime. I don't think. Mm. I mean, I don't know me wrong. I know that yes, there are people who might sort of buy a small amount of hash or something to kind of, you know, so they can sell yeah. a bit to their mates to cover it. Yeah. But if you want to go beyond that, mm. that you, that I think you have to be fully committed to it. There was a, there's a term that comes from a, a Mob Deep um, rap song right. <laughs> called uh, Halfway Crooks. Oh, right, yeah. And it's, it's essentially about that. You can't be a halfway crook. Yes. So if you're going to sit there selling hash and everything, you have to learn to be able to protect yourself. Yeah. So you have to sit there with a the weapon and everything. You can't just sit there with a the weapon. You've got to be able to defend yourself. Yeah. Um, and not only that, if you want to see your sales going well, you've got to take out the other dealers around you. Um, so this yeah. is, you know, this, this, you, can, you can play at it or you yeah. can you can be, a, you know, full time at it. Yeah. Um, and that's what we used to do. We used to set people up. We used to rob them. We used to rob other dealers. We used to fucking wow. trick people. Um, you know, you'd have a girl knocking on the door and then as soon as, as soon as the door opened, we'd push the girl out of the way and we'd go in there. Um, oh, and, yeah. uh, you know, because obviously everyone looks through the people and things and they're not going to answer the door to me and stuff. And um, so, yeah. I mean, like I say, we 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 went all in. Um, <laughs> there yeah. wasn't anything that I wouldn't do. Um, but then again, that was the the fucked up reward system. And I've I've spoken about all the money I've ever earned is gone. Yeah. You know, I didn't bury anything. I never I never made enough money. It was always just petty crime, you know, petty robberies and things. I never made huge amounts. I moved large amounts of drugs, but they cost a lot of money. So yeah. if I've got forty grand sat there. It was to pay for the drugs, and I made a couple of grand off the top of it. Yeah. You know, so it was um, it was never something that I could retire on. Um, and I always did it for like the high fives in the pub. You know that was as, that was as stupid as I was as a you know twenty five year old. You know. Yeah, but then um, a young a young man sometimes wants that. Yeah. You yeah. know, in in whatever walk, whatever you were doing, you kind of want not not, not everyone's the same, but mm. as as a young man, you do want respect from people and you do want kudos from people. Yeah. And I can see how it happens. I so I was living it. that fucked up reward system, whereas you know I wasn't doing anything. You know I wasn't mm. the top salesman in, in my work. I wasn't doing that. But I went the other way. You know yeah. I was putting a lot of effort into being the top criminal around here. Yeah. You know. So yeah, again, yeah. you talk about that misplaced kind of um, potential. Yeah. You know, and it takes a lot. You know, like I say, it takes a lot to do what you've done. As in, you know, put yourself in the room with some dangerous people. Yeah. Um, which is what I've learned from today weirdly mm. I've, I've, I've never I mean I've, I kind of knew but didn't know yeah. so, so in terms of th th this you know the mutual journey here it, it's almost you know you can look back on what you've learned and process things over a period of time and it takes as long as it takes mm. and you know and part of me I'm going to leave today thinking oh actually I think I might be a little bit braver <laughs> than I've realised you know I, I don't think yeah. I'm going to sort of walk into town and go right who wants some but yeah. um, I but but I think overall, I'll, I'm quite proud of the fact, I suppose, mm. maybe. Well, I think, you know, we've covered 
a lot of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, you know, it's been it's been amazing speaking to you as always. Thank you. Um, Thank you very much, Wayne. Uh, I'd be interested. I, I I would encourage you to put your stories onto YouTube as well, um, because. Yeah. Uh, obviously, they're, they're available if anybody wants to listen to them. Um, search Conversations with Criminals um, with Matt Price. Um, look on Facebook and things, and uh, they're they're all available on any podcast. Um, yes, they're, they're place, on all they? the platforms, yeah. Yeah, so you can get them on Google, Apple, anywhere you look for. Yeah, Conversations with Criminals. My one is uh, Picking Up Dead Rats. And yes. I, was quite, I was quite proud that I was the first two-parter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I wanted to do it in two parts. Because, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I as you know, well... I left here, and you're thinking, you with you, I now know thinking, God, what have I, what have I just told him? Yeah. And I left thinking, Wow, what have I just heard? Yeah. And I listened to it like three times. Fantastic. On on the bus, well, actually walking to the bus, and then I got, and then I listened to it again when I got home. I listened to it again the following morning, and then a week later, my dad, or whenever it came out, my dad phoned me. Would bear in mind, he won't even phone me on my birthday <laughs> to say, Well, that was very interesting. Mm. I think you know that that's what you should be looking for. Because that's that's insanely humbling. Because as you remember, when I when you left here, I was just like, well, sorry, sorry if I've bored you for oh. the last like hour, you know. Because what? again, the mundane, the things I was talking about just seemed boring and mundane. You know, wow. we didn't even get onto the exciting bits of like robbing people and holding them hostage and things, and you know. But oh. but it's you know, but, but but that isn't what people want to hear. You know, that's not. Well, it's interest. It, it's always interesting. Your spin on stuff is always interesting, as mm. far as I'm concerned. And of course. I've sat here thinking to myself, God, you are spe spectacularly tedious today, Price. Not only do you not look funny, but how boring are you? So, you know, so we do it to ourselves. Yeah, and I think that it's sometimes, and I think it's just part of, part of being a thinker maybe. And, sure. you know, and, and, but. But, you know, to the average you know, lady who sits in Devon knitting all day, um, your, even your path is, is just insanely interesting. Just the way you've gone from, being almost where well, you went from being a victim of crime, you and yeah. Martha, yeah, yeah. to then sitting around the table with some of the most dangerous people in the country and holding your own and getting advice from them and becoming good friends with them, not yeah. being robbed by these people. <laughs> yeah, well, do you know what, what? Really thinking about it, that's quite an achievement. Yeah, just <laughs> swimming with sharks and you know holding on and being fine. Um, <laughs> and uh, to, to you know, from a, a Cornish lad coming yeah. from uh, you know the, the, the country to, to where you have been. Wow, wow, I've never thought about that. Right? Yeah, brilliant, fantastic. So uh, yeah, thank you very much, um, thank and you. to everyone listening, uh, look for Matt Price. And uh, yeah, it's been a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you very much. Brilliant. So after speaking to Matt, and uh, you know, after after thinking about this and then listening to this again afterwards, the bit that jumped out at me was um, you know when he when he said you know was he a coward, and uh, I you know I couldn't think of any less of a person who I would think of is as, as a coward um you know the circles that he moved in and the and the position he put himself in after uh after his partner being attacked and things was 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 nothing of the actions of a coward or someone who was afraid in any way at all um he's just not the uh, he's just not a criminal um so that was the difference between the actions that he took and you know the uh, the path he went down Rather than the actions and the and the path that I would have taken or, or other people would have taken, um, who are the acts of a criminal. So, um, yeah, he would probably done it in the most uh, logical way and the way that kept him out of trouble the most. Um, because I, you know, I've always thought that um, if anything ever happened to my wife or if anything ever happened to you know a family member of mine, then you know I would react violently and I, you know there'd be nothing I wouldn't do to uh, to get revenge on these people. But you know, then I would end up with a long time in prison. And you know these the people that I was protecting and, and fighting for would be uh, would be you know sat outside writing to me saying to me that they wish I hadn't have done it you know they would have been happy with me not doing it um, so yeah it's uh, it's definitely the right path that Matt took you know the one of uh, of dealing with it internally um, and just and just forgetting about it externally um, but uh, yeah. Thank you very much for Matt um, to for coming on the podcast. Uh, next week um, we're going to have uh, there's a, there's a prison officer I've spoken to who um, who spent 30 years plus um, in the service. Um, we're going to be listening to him and talking to about stories of uh, uh, mental health in prison and uh, escape attempts and uh, and also uh, just the day to day life of, uh, of dealing with dispersal prisons. All right, so that one's going to be a little banger as well. So next Monday, 6 o'clock. Uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. Um, so, uh, yeah, brilliant. Cheers, thank you.